to the Fish Nerds. It's the latest about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd of the Fish Nerds Podcast, and we're so happy that you are listening. The show's been growing like crazy lately. We've been getting lots of cool attention, and we've done a lot of crazy stuff. Um, we thank all of everyone for being part of it. We're trying to get back to our regular format now, but new ideas keep coming, which is fantastic. So, Today on the show, we've got Hugo Medeiros back. Hugo's going to bring us his Killing Fish in Time with Hugo. I think we're eating smooth dogfish tonight. We also are going to explore in depth the question of are cormorants a conservation win or a fishing pest? Or is there something in the middle there? The other thing we're doing is we're trying something brand new. There's been some demand for fishing reports, so we are asking listeners to call 607-378-FISH and uh, leave us a voicemail and tell us, uh, in less than a minute's time, what is the fishing like in your area? So it would sound something like this. Hi, my name is Clay Groves from Fish Nerds Guide Service, and here in New Hampshire, the Mount Washington Valley, the fishing has been excellent in the lakes and ponds. Bass are on the beds. Trout are biting in the lakes, but the rain has made the fishing in rivers very difficult, so catching trout in rivers is hard right now. Thanks for checking in, and for more information, you can go to fishners.com to check out our guide service. That's an example. You could be as creative as you want to be, uh, and at the end of each show, we will mix those in. So you listen through the show, at the end of the credits, you will hear fishing reports. My hope is we'll get a ton of these from all over the world, and You'll hear a fishing report from your area, or maybe you'll think about, geez, maybe I want to go to Saco, Maine and fish with Captain Sean or do something like that. So uh, check it out at the end of each show going forward, as long as we're getting calls in. And, you know, that's the hope, right? So uh, it's at 607-378-FISH, and you can be part of the show. And by the way, you can use that number at any time to leave us any voicemail and be part of the show. We're always happy to hear from listeners. Our show is brought to you by you, our listeners. Speaking of which, we are crowdfunded through Patreon. We ask that if you like this show, you head to patreon.com forward slash fish nerds and give us a dollar an episode. So four bucks a month, four dollars a month. Not much uh, out of your pocket, but the money goes directly into keeping this show going. This show uh, has gotten to a point where it's actually kind of expensive to run. Our bandwidth use, routing website, buying swag, all this kind of stuff, and equipment. We need equipment. Costs money. And if you give us just $4 a month, you will be a Fish Nerds hero. We'll mail you some decals, and every so often you'll get a random package in the mail from us and some thank you notes. Uh, and it really appreciates it. And $4 a month does not hurt you. But in the scope of things for the Fish Nerds, it's big. If a bunch of people do that, then we don't need to seek outside sponsors. And I would love to never have sponsors. We're going to have sponsors because we're not getting enough money. But if enough of you did that, we would just say, see you later, sponsors, and just take your money, and it's your show. Uh, If you own a business uh, and you want us to mention your business on the show, donate us $25 an episode, and we will mention your business, like our friend Josh Lopes at lopestax.com. If you're in Massachusetts and need a great accountant, he's your guy. He's also my neighbor uh, in New Hampshire sometimes. So uh, patreon.com slash fish nerds, $4 a month goes a long way to keeping this show going. All right, time for some killing fish in time with Hugo. Hugo Medeiros is our friend. He lives down in Massachusetts. He's kind of like our resident seagull. He will eat anything. And for years, uh, the fish nerds have been like really trying to talk people into eating differently, more sustainably, uh, so, so varying their diet. And Hugo's a great example of, of uh, a guy who has a varied fish diet. His background allows him to, to eat lots of different kinds of fish. He's Portuguese. His wife, I believe, is from the Philippines. Um, and both those cultures are really big fish cultures, and they eat tons of fish. There's no such thing as trash fish in those cultures. Uh, so Hugo was out fishing last week, and he caught smooth dogfish, and he made us some Thai green curry dogfish. Now, the question is, is dogfish sustainable? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, in, according to some, it is, and according to some, it's not, and it all depends on how you on how you measure it. One thing we do know about smooth dogfish is they are relatively high in mercury, meaning about 25% of those fish have a higher than the recommended amount of mercury in their in their meat. Now, mercury aggregates over time, so the bigger the fish you get, the more mercury you're going to have. 
By the way, other fish that are high in mercury include tuna and swordfish and all your big sharks. Um, because they're, the higher up the food chain you eat, the more mercury you're going to aggregate. Uh, but dogfish are in huge numbers right now in New England, and we're trying to see what we can do with them. Spiny dogfish, a smaller one, do not have as much mercury as the uh, as a smooth dogfish. So here is Hugo with Thai green curry dogfish. Mm. Oh, how good's that sound? Yum. Okay, guys, Hugo Madero's here, fishing correspondent for the fish nerds. Back at you with some crazy seafood adventures. Here we got another rendition of uh, dogfish that I recently caught. So I've said it before, uh, dogfish, you know, it's a, it's a fish that uh, not many people take, not many people keep, not many people eat. Um, I was lucky enough to get some uh, fresh this Saturday. I was fishing with a buddy of mine. And uh, today we are making a dogfish Thai style green curry. And it is looking awesome over here. So what we have done with this one is uh, this is real simple, a quick lunch. And it's smelling awesome already. So I took some uh, ginger, uh, minced it, took some uh, red onion and sliced it, julienned it, and uh, some uh, scallions. So just saw that, sauteed that in a pan over a medium high heat with some Pam spray and got that cooking over that medium high heat. It was pretty quick, about two minutes. It was nice and... Uh, ready to go just doing it quick didn't need to render it down that much and in it I threw in a cup of uh, light coconut milk and then I took some uh, beautiful dogfish fillets that I had ready to go and cut them up into about one or two inch chunks and now we have them sitting in there and just cooking real quick as you can hear that's on high because I am starving and this smells awesome. Now, I love my Thai green curries. I've made them from scratch before with the lemongrass and the kaffir lime leaves and all that stuff. And it comes out awesome. Now, I was surprised to find this uh, dry green curry blend. It was cheap, relatively, and I found it at, I think it was a TJ Maxx, so I figured I'd give it a try. I tried it and it is awesome. It tastes authentic. So I just add, you know, like I said, the ginger and the scallions and stuff to uh, give it a little bit of a freshness. But it's an awesome blend. I've been um, making it a few times. The brand of it, I, I don't promote anything, but I just like this one. It's called the Gourmet Collection Spice Blends. So this one was really cool. So now we're gonna try. I have this off the heat. And let's see how we're doing here. Looks wonderful. And of course, you guys will see the uh, pictures on uh, fishnerds.com. And let us see how we're looking here. Oh, this stuff is spicy as well. Oh, wow. It's awesome. Real strong flavor. And I use probably double of the amount of the spice that they recommend. But wow, is that good. So there you have it, folks. Another dogfish recipe. Oh, keep in mind, if you're worried about mercury levels, please check out online and see for yourself. Uh, you don't, according to some reports I've seen looking real quick, you don't want to eat these five days a week. Or not even close. But I'm going to eat these ones that I got, and I love it. Oh, later, guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, we appreciate you taking the uh, mercury hit for our fans. Makes a big difference for us. Okay. Hey, for listeners, the Fish Nerds podcast, Vinyl Me, please, is a vinyl record of the month club, the best record club. In fact, every month, Vinyl Me, please, features one album that is essential to every modern vinyl collection and sends it to thousands of members worldwide. Uh, other, other things they do is they will... Um, They'll send you this record, and they're going to pair it with drink recipes. So if you're a hipster with a great beard 
and you've got a, a good record player, you can now get a record every month and then a little recipe with some something to go with it. Um, uh, it looks like a really cool club. I've joined. I haven't got my first record yet, but I've done done it. Uh, if you go to join vmp.com slash fish nerds you could join now and the fish nerds get a little taste of your membership fee to help us support the podcast again that's join vmp.com slash fish nerds to join vinyl me please uh do it if you're a music nerd i know a lot of our listeners love love audio so do it and uh, have a great time with it and let us know how it goes and let us know if you like it um, again, that's, that's Vinyl Me Please. That's joinvmp.com slash fish nerds. Uh, time for some fish in the news. Everyone loves some fish in the news. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. Here's the question we're asking today in Fish in the News. Are cormorants a pest or are cormorants a conservation win? And so I'm going to read you a story from the AP about this. And, and the reason this came up, I'm going to tell you why. Um, I get into it sometimes on Facebook with fishing groups. I find that a lot of times fishing people, I'm going to say fishermen because they're almost exclusively men, have this attitude. Uh, they see an animal eating a fish and that animal becomes a scapegoat animal on why they can't catch fish. So I was following along with a Facebook discussion about cormorants on Lake Champlain and the stuff people were spewing got horrible. And it wasn't just about controlling populations of cormorants. It got into shooting ospreys and like some really old school, like 19, like 1800s level animal control where every animal you see is a threat to the animals you're going to eat. And very kind of like it went off of like a conversation about control to a conversation about just mass slaughtering of everything that's not a salmon. Uh, and I got into it with them. I called people bucket biologists and picked some fights. And then I and then I decided to do a little research on this before I started uh, calling names. Uh, I, but I should have done the research before calling <laughs> names. So I still like to call names, but do the research first. So this is from the AP, and this is... Um, from June 22nd, 2016. So it's actually a year old, and that's relevant because we're a year out from this story, and, and I have interviewed someone who actually will give us an update on this. So decision on rivaled seabird has foes feeling helpless. Again, this is from the AP. Four Brothers Island in New York, uh, that's on Lake Champlain. Biologists worry a decision by a federal judge to block programs that control double-crested cormorants in 24 states could set back their efforts on the birds. Blame for depleting, oh sorry, despoiling, it's a new word for me, islands in Lake Champlain where they nest. In other areas of the country, cormorant seabirds with long necks and hooked bills are blamed for eating thousands of sport fish favored by anglers and preying on fish farms. Vermont officials, who this time of year are usually overseeing control programs that include oiling eggs to prevent them from hatching and shooting the birds or scaring them away, worry that even one year without control program could see the numbers of cormorants on the lake increase by 21%, which makes sense. Uh, it will not take very long for that number to double without some active management, said Mark Scott, a wildlife director for Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife, which manages about 20 islands in some sections of shoreline that have been known to host cormorants. The March decision by the judge in Washington determined that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service didn't do its homework before issuing a pair of orders that let people kill thousands of cormorants each year to preserve vegetation in some areas and protect sport fish in 24 states and farm fish in 13 of those states. U.S. Fish and Wildlife spokesman Lori Paramore said the agency is studying its next step. Cormorants, which winter in south and spend summers on the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain, have nested on Champlain for at least a century. They are brought to near extinction by the pesticide DDT, and no one is sure why the numbers have increased dramatically over the last quarter century. Dave Kappen, a retired University of Vermont biologist who has managed the cormorant program on the Four Brothers Islands, estimates there are 1,600 breeding pairs of cormorants on the lake, down from a peak of about 4,000 15 years ago. The islands lie in the middle of the narrow 120-mile-long lake and are owned by the Nature Conservancy and are off limits to the public. They nest in huge numbers and they kill trees on the islands on the lake, Captain said. There are at least five or six islands in this lake that have lost uh, most of their trees and vegetation. Captain disagrees with Scott's assertion that the birds would increase by 21% in one year without control. He said he feels as long as the control programs resume by next spring, there should, shouldn't be any long-term setback. 
Mike Freeze, the president of the National Aquaculture Association, who runs a fish farm in Arkansas, says cormorants eat more of the farm's fish than any other birds in the winter. He has two or three employees who work full-time protecting the company's 1,000 acres of ponds from birds, especially cormorants. Cormorants aren't a problem in Arkansas in June, but Freeze and others in the industry are watching the legal case. We've got to have some kind of relief by October. That's when the hordes descend on us. They migrate, the cormorants. Uh, Cormorants have a long history of being hated by humans. And Ken Stromberg, a retired U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist from Denmark, Wisconsin, who was among the those who filed the lawsuit against the service that led to the March decision block in the control programs. A cormorant is a scapegoat for everything that consumers are unhappy about, said Stromberg, who is opposed to cormorant control programs but feels the Fish and Wildlife Service must do the required studies before issuing orders. Matt Trombley, a Vermont-based fishing charter captain who fishes on Lake Champlain and Ontario, said he's no biologist, but he's worried about the end for now of the cormorant control program. If we don't keep up each year, they're going to overpopulate, he said. Then it's a huge step to try and get them back under control. So that is the story from the AP a year ago. Uh, and here's a couple of other facts. So there's thousands of cormorants there now. In 1982, there's only 35 cormorants in, on Lake Champlain, right? Cormorants are not considered natives to the Lake Champlain area, but they're not... Um, but they are native to that to the area, so uh, which is kind of a weird thing to say. Like they're not, or they are, but historically they don't they don't know um, what the long term history of the cormorants were there. But they are native to North America. Uh, cormorants eat on average one pound of fish per day, and their diet is almost um, the exact ratio of fish species in the lake. So seventy percent yellow perch. But they are opportunistic feeders and will eat freshly stocked fish, um, which which are like super easy targets, right? Uh, so th- that's the problem we're dealing with. I got into it online in a debate with Rob Thorne. Now, Rob Thorne owns Captain Thorny's Fishing Charters, and he and I went back and forth online, and it got a little heated. And so rather than keep and dig it in, I sent him a message. I said, hey, Rob, I'm not trying to, to pick a fight with you. I'm just, I get really defensive for wildlife. I'm a, I'm a fishing guide myself. I understand the value of the fish, but I, I always, I'm afraid we're jumping to conclusions here. And he... He was cool. He was gracious enough to to message me back and offer to come and share his first-person knowledge. Now, I will say the knowledge you gain first-person as a fisherman is what's called anecdotal, but it's important information. So it's just it's observations. We need to combine that information, of course, with the scientific research and find out where, where the truth lies. And it's usually somewhere in the middle. Uh, so here's my conversation with with Rob Thorne from Captain Thorny's Fishing Charters. Hello. Hey, is this Captain Thorny? <laughs> this is Captain Thorny. Yes, sir. Hey, this is Clay. How's it going? <laughs> Good, Clay. How are you? Happy to be here tonight. Hey, yeah, so cool. And I'm going to just quick intro. I found you on Facebook because it was a big conversation happening on one of the fishing pages about cormorants. And I got really defensive for the cormorants, and I called everyone bucket biologists, and I kind of went on that really negative tear, which makes me kind of a dick. I'm sorry. But um, I got really defensive, and then you came in with some facts, and other people came in with some facts, and then I private messaged you and said, hey, Rob, I wasn't trying to pick a fight. I just got defensive, and I'm sorry. And I invited you to come on the show and share your experience. You've been a guide on Lake Champlain for 35 years. Is that correct? No, I've I've been um, actively uh, fishing Lake oh, Champlain fishing. for okay. the last thirty five years. Yeah, you're not old enough um, to have been thirty five years. No, I've <laughs> I've been I've been chartering for the last six years. Okay, cool, good. And your charter business is Thor- is Captain Thorny's Fishing Charters, and you focus on primarily what species? What do you what do you target? Primarily trout and salmon. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I also run some wildlife trips in the summer. Mm-hmm. And there's 90, 98 species of fish in Lake Champlain, which is remarkable. New Hampshire, the entire state, we have 48 species, right? So to see 98 kinds of fish in one lake is remarkable. How'd you zero in on, on being a, a salmon and trout person? Well, I, you know, I, I grew up uh, trolling for salmon on Lake George mm-hmm. and as, uh, you know, fishing with my dad and, um, Unfortunately, back in the 80s, uh, the salmon fishing in Lake George um, 
peaked and crashed very quickly with fishing pressure. Okay. And as okay. it did, uh, yep, well, sw- small lake, heavy pressure. Sure. Uh, got them. It's got some fantastic notoriety. A 19-pounder was caught back in the 80s and set the state record. That's all it takes, and it, right? And <laughs> it blew out of control. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we, 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 we took our fishing talents uh, from Lake George up to Lake Champlain when I was uh, a teenager mm-hmm. and, you know, fell in love with uh, fishing Lake Champlain. And, you know, years later, I, I, I transferred to Vermont and, and, uh, and another job. And, you know, I ended up spending most of my life uh, chasing trout and salmon on Lake Champlain as I did when I was a kid. And now you're back to it. Um, but, you know, I, I, I fish for just about anything with fins. Mm-hmm. You know, I, tar- I target trout and salmon um, for the most part because I, I, it's, it's always been my passion. But, you know, I, I fish for bass. Um, I'll, I'll take excursions with, with friends and, and play for carp or walleye or bowfin or northern. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm no fish prude by any way. I like anything with fins. Yeah, that's how I am too. I'm a species person. Now, I, now I'm, I'm, we're going to get to the cormorant story in a second, but I'm just, I like talking fish, so we'll do that first. Um, now, I read somewhere that Lake Champlain is legal to shoot fish with a rifle. Is that still a thing? There is an early season, I believe. I'm, I'm not really well versed on it. I do have some friends that do it, mm-hmm. um, but uh, most of it is done, I believe, with bow and spear. But there is uh, an early season for shooting. Oh, I got it. I want to try that someday, just once, <laughs> just to see what it's like. <laughs> sounds, sounds, sounds crazy. So. But, but, but let's get, let's talk about cormorants now. So cormorants, uh, I've been doing a little research. Um, in 1972, we're all about but extinct, um, you know, they were pretty much run down because of DDTs. And then uh, they got, we took DDT out of the marketplace and the birds got protected. Um, in 1982, on Lake Sheeran Plain, there were known to be 35 nesting pairs. Uh, and now there's there's thousands of nesting pairs, right? Is that, is that match? Uh, yeah, that, that's, yes. So on a, from a conservation um, standpoint, we're like, wow, look at this bird came back. But from a fisherman standpoint, we're like, holy smokes. Look at all these birds, right? Is that well? There's, 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 you know, like when when anything explodes in population like that, there's always a lot of unintended circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, growing up fishing uh, the the central portion of the lake, you have the Four Brothers Islands, which um, was always allocated by uh, New York State as a bird sanctuary. Right. Um, and, you know, there was always abundant, for the size of the islands, there was always abundant um, trees and foliage and lots of nesting for the native birds and egrets um, of Lake Champlain. Well, uh, the cormorants have now killed all of that vegetation. There virtually isn't a tree left out there, right. and the native birds are all gone. So there's not much there to study. You know, the, the state used to have biologists that would spend a lot of time studying the birds and their habits on, that, on those islands, and now it's virtually nothing but um, dead vegetation and um, cormorants and uh, seagulls. Yeah, no, I read the, I, I looked at the website, um, I forget the website, but I saw the photos of those islands, and they really are like this desolate wasteland with thousands and thousands of birds. And until just a few years ago, there was control measures in place to to help uh, control the, the overpopulation of the cormorants. They were putting like um, vegetable oil or olive oil or something on eggs, uh, and there was a shoot for the adults. And that, a couple of years ago, was halted because of a judge, right? Like when you yes. say, stop all yeah, there, this. Yeah, there, there was, there was a, uh, actually, I believe um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was sued by a group out of Washington, D.C. that was worried about the unfair treatment of the birds. Mm-hmm. And as uh, a judge dug, dug into um, the original um, background information that uh U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service used for their permits, I believe it was deemed um, that they didn't have enough. And they're working now to update and uh, get those permits reissued. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a timely study 
Right. So it's, we're they're, kind they're of in limbo. Players. Meantime. So you're you fishing. Know, and you're fishing. <clears throat> you're fishing for salmon and stuff, and you're noticing a decline. It's slow every year. It's harder to catch these fish. Is that accurate? Well, you know, it, we've had a phenomenal turnaround in the fishery. It hasn't happened overnight. Right. Um, we've, we've had we've had a long, slow but effective lamprey control process, Mm -hmm. um, which has taken about 10 plus years now. And along with that, we've had cormorant control. Mm -hmm. Now, the last um, three years ago, we had a record run of salmon in the streams, to the tune of about 1,500 documented. Which is great. Biggest run the lake has ever had. Are your salmon able to spawn naturally, or are they completely managed? In New Hampshire, we manage every single fish, right? We don't have a native population of uh, landlocked Atlantic salmon. So does Champlain have, like, a population that actually reproduces on its own, or are they completely managed, you know, or is it a combination? Um, for the most part, it is completely managed, but there's a there's been a major effort to try to get natural um, natural reproduction, mm-hmm. and there's been great strides made in recent years. For a while, because of uh, VHS and the concern of uh, viruses spreading into inland waters, um, there's uh, there's dams in the Winooski, and they weren't allowing fish to be transferred above the dams where they had the habitat they really needed right. to um, to to reproduce and survive. Um, two years ago, uh, they realized that okay, VHS hasn't become an issue. These viruses aren't affecting us, so we're going to give the salmon a chance. And the last couple of years, they have had a lot of um, active fish on the reds in uh, the upper reaches of the Winooski. They have been um, effective. You also had a major dam on the New York side on the Boquette River, which gave the fish the entire run of the Boquette River for the last two years, and they've had some success there. So in the last couple of years, we have had some some really good signs of what could be uh, a return of natural reproduction of salmon in the lake. That's great. Um, and, and this is where um, we start to go downhill as um, this cormorant ruling came. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, two years ago we had the record spawn. Last year that spawn dropped in half. One year's time we went from what was approximately 1,500 to seven or 800. Okay. My concern, I, the, the flag for me went up last fall because those fish – uh, are generally stocked between nine and twelve inches in the spring, as what would be a one-year-old. Right, and that's eating and size. Genera- <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So in the fall, uh, um, when those fish are are healthy as they generally are, um, we we have what we call a lot of shakers. Uh, those fish are legal at fifteen, and we get a lot of fourteen to uh, seventeen inches throughout the fall sometimes as much as 20, 30, 40 a day. That's why we That's highly amazing. recommend that no one uses treble hooks. Sure. Because if you have a simple thigh wash hook, you know, one quick shake at the back of the boat, and that fish takes right off, and there's very little harm done. However, last year I was really concerned because there were very, very few shakers in the creels. Um, nobody was catching them, and I was really concerned that the cormorants had done a lot of damage um, now, this year, uh, of course, now we're, we're a year and a half from the ruling, or, or almost, and um, we're all seeing just unbelievable, unbelievable hordes of cormorants, mm-hmm. um, you know, unlike we have ever seen on the lake. You know, in the past, we've always had the nest oiled. Um, we have, for, for a few years... <laughs> decent numbers of them being shot by federal agents because it was never allowed to be done by the state. Mm -hmm. But um, for the last several years, there's been no more shooting, um, but the eggs have always been oiled. Mm -hmm. Now we have nothing, and these birds are really getting out of control. Now is there any, Um, I guess I'm just a biologist, but is there any chance those birds are going to reach their carrying capacity and self-manage, or do you think it's going to keep going and going and going? It doesn't look like it. Yeah, it's hard. To- um, it, it, it's hard to know, but uh, if, if, if 
if that is anything close to where we are right now, and I really don't think it is no. because we're only one year out. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, but this year we 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 didn't see the um, the shakers last year, those one year olds. So this year, those fish would be two year olds, and nobody is catching anything in the fifteen to twenty inch range. They're not out there. There's a lot of nice fish being caught in the 21 to 28, 29 inch range, which is all three, four, and some five year olds. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I placed a salmon and the rotary last week in third place, which was 8.2 pounds. Uh, that's probably a, a four or five year old fish, a gorgeous <laughs> fish. And there's, 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 there's some, there's some decent fish being caught out there. Mm-hmm. Um, four weeks ago, there was a really nice fish caught by a friend of mine, uh, Dave Adams in the Detilio's Derby that went over 11 pounds. Wow. Okay. There, there are. Like I said, this fishery has come a long way, but those fish um, had the opportunity to um, to to survive and grow when cormorants were what I will call in relative check sure. prior to this judge's ruling. Okay, now my my major concern, which is why I've I've gotten involved in some social media and we had the conversation on Facebook the other day that we had, is because. Um, this year, um, we don't have any one-year-olds, and it's obvious from what I've been seeing on the lake that, that I believe the cormorants have already devoured what was put in the lake this year. So I was... Okay, so now we have just lost two generations of salmon. Now you got four years to um, up. So I was reading so, some of the stomach studies of the cormorants, what they've been eating. Uh, I think Sea Grant did a study on Lake Champlain a few years ago, and they say the... The stomach pop, the stomach contents of the cormorants that they tested, and this is when they were doing, still doing shooting, so they were able to t- to get the cormorants and, and see what they had in their stomachs, matched um, the exact ratio of fish in the lake, the, the largest percentage of fish being you know, small yellow perch, it's about 70 some odd percent, and the rest being a variety, except during stocking time. <laughs> and then they Bingo. Found, then they found that during stocking is when the fish were easiest to catch and the cormorants were getting them. They weren't getting them the rest of the time, um, but that stocking is when they're super easy to get them, and that's when they've been devouring all those fish. So I think you're on the money. I think you're right. Oh, you're, you're, well, you're, you know, the, 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 the biggest problem with, with this issue, you know, as opposed to lamprey control, mm-hmm. okay, lamprey control, we had a lot of studies. We had data. Mm-hmm. We had wounding rates. We had facts, okay? Now... Um, we can say that, you know, okay, you know, we know fish are stocked um, in front of Apple Island. We know they're put in down a Converse. Uh, we know that they're stocked off the ferry lanes. And we can watch these birds stage up in all these given areas and devour our fish. But in the end, the argument with someone who's defending the birds becomes a he said, he said with, well, how do you know they're really eating your fish? Right. Well, that was my um, first thing. Is, what do you mean? There's tons of fish out there, but now I'm doing the research. Yes. And it's, it's kind of, I think you're right. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. And, 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 and it's, it's, you know, it, it, we, we've been living with the cormorants on the lake for a long time. Sure. And like I say, you know, when we had the oiling of the eggs and, and, and control that as fishermen, we would have liked to have seen more, but we were keeping them in check so we could still have a solid fishery. Sure. But, you know, as, as there are no checks in place, um, as you know, with, with, with wildlife, you know, uh, and management of wildlife, um, harvesting is a big piece of managing, you know, whether, whether it be, you know, deer, or turkeys, or coyotes, or birds, you know, big geese, or, or ducks, or whatever the case may be. And here you have a very, you know, prolific and, and not not a native bird uh, who has um, found a very comfortable home in the Champlain Valley and sure. uh, is, is just out of control. And we're feeding them. So, I, yeah, I was trying to figure out they were native or not, and I couldn't. I couldn't find that information. I found that numbers were historically really, really low even before DDT, um, but they generally weren't big in those smaller lakes because they're designed for larger bodies of water than Champlain. Right. And that's why they become trouble, right? It's because in the ocean, we don't think of them as such a pest because it's the ocean, right? <laughs> so, but you go on to small lakes like Champlain, and we're like, well, it's not small lakes. Champlain's huge, but it's comparatively small. It- 
Well, when 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 you look at the the hundreds and thousands of these birds that flock up and down the lake, and you see how quickly they will get from one spot to another. And you know, if there's one thing you can say about a, the the birds, the birds are much worse than fishermen when there's a hot bite on. Oh, they, they <laughs> announce it, right? <laughs> you know, I, 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 it's it's and and you know this the, the last couple of weeks as as we, we've been fishing the southern end of the lake, it it's it's just. Most of us have just been awestruck as we watch these enormous um, flocks of uh, cormorants joined in with seagulls as they just go into feeding frenzies, unlike anything we've seen in past years. That's crazy. Um, the, the numbers have, have, have really been um, concerning. And, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to watch it happen because, you know, being as active um, as I am in the lake, you know, I... I I network a lot with uh, biologists from uh, the, the state of Vermont, the state of New York, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, I know how much work and research goes into um, the stocking programs and, and corm- or, uh, lamprey control, and there's so much hard work and dedication by so many to go into the management of Champlain to create the the what's really become a world-class fishery in past years Mm -hmm. and to watch that all go down the drain because of a ruling that um, has allowed a bird that was, you know, extremely abundant to begin with now go completely unchecked. Unchecked. Yeah. So what, what can people do? Like what's the next steps? Do do, you, is there like an organization that you're working with or is there like people? Well, there's, there's, there's some forming now, and, and, and I'm hoping what we're going to see uh, arise in the next six months is really more of um, a nationwide cooperative. There are many groups now that are really concerned about the damage that these cormorants are doing from the Great Lakes, from uh, groups like Ducks Unlimited and Trout Unlimited. And um, there's, there's, there's a lot of groups, and I think... You know, the, the one thing we struggle as outdoorsmen at times is really organizing in unity mm-hmm. when we really want to make a point. Um, and I, I'm hoping and, you know, for, for the most part right now, um, sportsmen and fishermen that really want to see uh, these birds controlled, we, we, we need to send letters and make phone calls to, you know, our governors and our senators to let them know how important this issue is to us, and then they can put some pressure on U.S. Fish and Wildlife to make to get the information and these studies done in a quicker manner and facilitate this process. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated issue because they were once in, so endangered, and you can see why people who are not part of your lake maybe get defensive for them. And then you know, hopefully people can – my hope is that people can be open-minded and hear what you're saying as opposed to just making their judgments where they're 100, 200, 300 miles away or whatever, like I did earlier. Uh, so, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> because I'm, I'm coming around. I'm coming around on this. And the more I read about it, I'm understanding what you're saying. Um I won't even tell you, though, because my friend Dave and I founded an event called Sea Lamprey Appreciation Day because we love lampreys in New Hampshire. They're native here. Um, and so, and so we, do, we do lamprey touch tanks, and, and we're trying to get people to New Hampshire to like the lampreys as opposed to what the rest of the country who doesn't like them. But that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, fine. I, I'm fine with many different um, species of lamprey, just not the ones that attack all our game fish in Lake right. Champlain. Well, it's the same species, Petromyzum <laughs> marinus. It's a stone sucker of the sea. But, but so lampreys are native to New Hampshire waters, and I've read they are actually historically native to Champlain as well, um, but not in large numbers. And they've got they've added to it with some canal. There's that. That's a and, that's a very disputed. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm sure and, of it. And, I'm and, sure of it. And, 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 and I don't I don't entirely buy that uh-huh. um, because if you look at all the historical pictures, there were never scars on any fish historically. Right. Well, the numbers. As, 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 but but if they were always there. Um, I mean, a, a, a lamprey is is a very prolific um, good at being creature. Lampreys. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and 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 if they were there, 
uh, back in the early 1900s when we had salmon and lake trout and whitefish and sturgeon. And sturgeon is probably one of the easiest ways to document it because they're a very big, easy target for a lamprey. Huge. And, and, and there was never any documentation of any hits on any of those species um, throughout history yeah. until um, the, the 80s yeah. when they really came on the scene. So um, I kind of understand that argument, but I can't say though I can buy into it being a native species. <laughs> well, it's interesting because when I'm reading about, I'm, 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 I'm so right now I get, I'm, I'm a fish nerd, so I get super into one thing at a time. And so right now I'm reading everything about Lake Champlain. And what I'm reading about with all these 98 species of fish you have there is a lot of them say this may be a native fish. This may be a native fish. Even Atlantic salmon, they say they're not convinced it's native to that. It's, it says it may be native um, because they don't have enough research done on these things. So it's, it's, yeah. they always leave them that little bit of wiggle room by saying it may be a native fish. Um, <laughs> so I'm always curious about that kind of thing. But I'm not going to dig in on that with you. Uh, in New Hampshire, we like lampreys. Um, but I understand why you don't. Uh, well, that's really cool. I mean, it sounds like you really know your stuff. I'm really, um, I'm really happy I talked to you tonight because it, it helps me to understand better. And hopefully our listeners will, will do some mo- more homework on this and you get some control. And I bet you uh, cormorants are delicious. Because <laughs> <So. laughs> I'll tell you, my, my, other, my other problem with biological controls that are killing things is that people aren't eating them. Like, I get all crazy about any big giant fish roundups where they're not eating the fish, lamprey roundups where they're not eating the lampreys, lampreys are delicious. Like, all these things people should be eating, and we're throwing food away, you know. And so I'm always curious, how come they're shooting them all anyway? Why don't we just have we, you, rooms, you know, you if, know and... if, 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 if the... If the pheromone technology for lamprey uh-huh. um, could get could get to the point where it could work, and we could draw them in naturally to a given area and trap them, there could be a really good market sure. for lamprey. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, um, my day job is uh, running a very high volume uh, seafood department. Oh, so you know and, stuff about and, seafood too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I know my for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're a total fish nerd. I can I didn't know this about you. Uh, it. It is fish twenty four seven. Oh yes. My God, oh, we're gonna be here all night. Um, <laughs> there could be. Um, I know there's some restaurants in Michigan that sell lamprey uh, on the menu, and in Portugal, it's like uh, I think it's like twelve ninety nine a pound for live sea lampreys right now. The market there, so they're. There is a small market here and there for them, and I've eaten a couple. You've never eaten them. I haven't eaten them. Right. No. Next time you get one. No. I, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm really happy to say it. Last year at this point, I had probably had um, at least 50 lamprey on my boat. That's a lot. And 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 this year, I think it's been five. Yeah. Now your lampreys don't get as big as our lampreys, right? I, I saw the Jeremy Wade episode where he put one on his neck, and uh, the river monsters, and it was only like, you know, like a foot and a half long, and not very. Yeah, big. we. I mean, they'll occasionally reach two or a little better, mm-hmm. um, but not much more than that. Yeah. Um, nothing, nothing like some of the lamprey I've seen come out of Lake Ontario, mm-hmm. which which seemed to, to to get up to three feet or better, and and sometimes, you know, uh, three inches in diameter. They yeah, they, they get pretty are, big. Yeah, ours are about about yeah. three and a half feet to four feet long, and just super fat, big happy lampreys. So, really, mm-hmm. really interesting stuff. Wow. Um, so, if people want to book a trip with you, since you know so much, you're probably worth going on the boat because you could really teach people a few things. How do they get you? You know, uh, they, they can um, friend me on Facebook or look me up on my page there. Uh, my, my phone number is 802-999-4779. And, you know... My 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 passion is fishing and teaching people. You know, there's nothing I like more than, especially having um, 
you know, some, some of my favorite outings are probably father sons that are just getting into the sport mm-hmm. uh, or father and daughter that, that want to come out and, and learn how to fish to do it on their own boat. Um, you know, when, 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 when you get people that are relatively new to the sport or young kids, you know, that's, that's where the fun really is when, you've, when, when, when you get new people hooked oh. and you teach them and, and see the excitement and watch, watch people catch their first trout and salmon. Um, that's or, or any new species sure. for that matter. Uh, it's just fun stuff. And you, and you fish ice out until when? Ice in. So really, and you don't guide on the ice? I I do, um, but I have a I I have a tug of war with my skis when it comes when it gets cold. I am, <laughs> the, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, it's funny because I'm a I'm a guide. Um, I've been guiding now for just oh, my first, just finished my first year as a guide, uh, and I only guide on the ice. I don't guide the rest of the year, um, and it's, it's t- so much fun. And the same as you, like that joy of teaching someone to catch their first fish through the ice or that first new species is such a such a pleasure. So, uh, listen, I really appreciate your time. I got to wrap this up, um, but um, this has been really enlightening, and I've learned more than I thought I would. I'm I'm really impressed. And uh, again, I apologize for calling everyone bucket biologist on your page. I got really defensive for the animals, and I was I was a little bit quick to judge. Uh, and I do that sometimes, but I'm also okay with being wrong. And I think on this case, I was on the wrong target. So, I thank you for I, that. I, I, I have no problem with that. I was, I was happy to have the opportunity to meet, to meet you there and, and discuss the issue. And look, here we are. Yeah, it's really and, good. And you know, uh, with, with, with a little luck, maybe uh, someday we'll be able to uh, uh, share some water together and catch some fish. I hope so. Well, if you're ever up in the White Mountains, New Hampshire, you've got a, you've got someone to take. I can take you ice fishing. <laughs> so <there's> that. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time, and I'll put a link up to your Facebook page on our on our um, website at fishners dot com when the show goes live, probably Monday. Um, Excellent. Yeah, and I appreciate your time. You're welcome, Clay. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Have a great night. Yeah. You too. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. So as you can see I, on that on that entire conversation, I go from being kind of against it to kind of for it to. Kind of against it. I I don't know how I feel about controlling cormorants. Um, I I think that we need to wait for the uh, some more data. Uh, but I also feel for the fishermen. And I was talking to someone yesterday about this problem, and they said to me, "Why don't we just because because the problem is this, right? The the cormorants are eating the stocked fish. They're, I mean, we hear that they're eating the stocked fish, and that's what's making it very hard for for commercial fishermen." Um, to get the fish they want to get. Uh, and cormorants are awake during the daytime. They are not nocturnal animals. So someone said, why don't they just do all the fish stocking at nighttime? And I don't know that the answer is going to be that simple, but it's. But I need to. we need to start looking at ourselves, holding a mirror up to what we're doing and saying, can we as fishermen or as management people do things differently? Because the animals are going to keep coming back. And we can't just keep killing everything. That's not going to solve a problem. It just creates new problems but um but can we do things different i was thinking can we stock those fish deeper can we stock them at nighttime can we you know there's 90 some odd fish in species of fish in lake sharon plank can we change what we're fishing for so there's a lot to talk about with that i would love to hear your opinion on it feel free to join the conversation on facebook we have a really great active uh, facebook group called the fish nerds podcast group and we'd be happy to discuss all this further but We're out of time. So, that's it. You've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. Special thanks to Hugo Medeiros for his dogfish segment and his willingness to suffer the effects of mercury poisoning for you. And, of course, our friend Rob Thorne from Captain Thorny's Fishing Charters on Lake Champlain. Big thanks to Diana's Bath Salt for providing the uh, music for Fish in the News. And until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds. Spawn early and often. Avoid free lunches with strings attached and swim against the current every chance you get. And now it's time for your local fishing report. If you want to report what fishing is like in your area and we want you to, call 607-378-FISH and leave us a report. Try to keep it to less than a minute. Unless it's a great story, then, you know, go on. Uh, Anyway, thank you so much for being part of this and good day to you.
Hey, fish nerds, Captain Sean here, MainTunaFishing.com, sailing out of beautiful Saco, Maine. So the uh, offshore fishing's getting hot. I know limits a haddock every day. Uh, nice slow pick of pollock and cusk and redfish and uh, a few hake here and there. Good day, to, good trip to fill the freezer. Now the inshore bite up here in Maine, the uh, striped bass are, are in. Not about, not many big ones around, but there's quite a few fish. Still a good time. Now we're offering open boat trips once a week. Give me a call at 207-502-0368. Uh, a little more detail on the open boat trips. Hey, this is Nick from North Conway calling in for the Fish Nerds Fishing Report. I am calling to say that the fishing is terrible everywhere. I can't seem to catch anything. So hopefully other people are, are having better luck than I. I will sh be sure to call in next week.